You're listening to Little Green Cheese, Episode 8. Well, welcome back. This is Little Green Cheese Podcast. I'm Gavin Weber, and this is where you can learn about making cheese at home. A little bit of a slack week this week. I've been sick with the flu, so I've been in bed, and the only cheese I could come up with was a cream cheese, but it was well worth it. It tastes delicious. Uh, When I feel a little bit up to it, I will then roll it in some herbs, and it'll taste beautiful, just like I mentioned the one in the last episode. Well, today I've got a treat. Today's interview is with Sharon Bailey. Uh, Sharon, introduce yourself. I'm uh, a mum and uh, wife. I've got two teenage daughters. I live in Calbeba, which is probably uh, 10K from the Barossa Valley in South Australia. Oh, okay, yeah. So um, a very nice place to live, um, a really good local food ethic in the Barossa Valley and um, um, I work three days a week um, which I love just perfect and grow my own well grow a lot of veggies Um, daughters are interested in horses they do eventing Um, what else gardening uh, cheese making soap making all that sort of stuff sounds like the same sort of stuff I do well, it's funny you should say that because a lot of it is from um, getting hold of your website and uh, getting inspired, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I was just about to say, why would you start cheese making? Cheese making. I started because I, a friend, and I've always fancied learning to make cheese. I don't know where that came from. And there was a short course at Other Delights in Handorf. Um and they use usually goat's milk, but I think this particular course was uh, with cheese uh, with uh, cow's milk for uh, feta, and it was a morning workshop with a lovely gourmet lunch, and we thought, oh, that sounds good. Uh, so I enjoyed that, and then sort of after that, I got onto your website probably for a year and um, saw your cheese making exploits, and um, uh, it the YouTube videos looked just you know very easy to follow, so I thought I'm going to give it a go. So I did. Fair enough. And I'm very um, slapdash and I'm not good at, I don't like to read instructions. Um, And uh, so I was really quite surprised that I'd managed to make edible cheese. Nice. But I think the videos really helped. Yeah, they were fantastic. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people have said that to me. So um, that they're they're good. Yeah. I'm cool with that. So uh, what what sort of cheeses have you made so far? What have I made? Well, I'm on my, I've just made my 39th cheese. Goodness me. And um, I've made a little list here. What have I made? I have made, uh, um, okay, cheddar, Romano, Parmesan, Colby, Gouda, mozzarella, Blue Stilton. Now, I don't know how you pronounce this. Is it Cantal? Cantal? Or Cantal, something like Cantal. that. And Neuchâtel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, camembert, C- Caffili, Cotswold. Um, yeah, but I haven't had much luck with, uh, feta. I've had to decide not to make that again because I've tried three times and it's just not how I like it. So, oh, okay. So not yeah. creamy or is it too sharp? Um, the taste is okay. It's the texture. I'm not getting the, the right texture and I'm really big into texture. Yeah. So, um, I've decided to, uh, probably, you know, go for the cheeses that I like and that work. Yeah. And, Sometimes you have to give up, I think. But yeah. Maybe I'll come back to it later. For sure. So where do you make your cheeses? I make my cheese in the kitchen on my terrible 20-year-old electric stove, which is quite dodgy. Um, when I first started, I used the camp gas stove Yeah. because I thought I'd be able to regulate the temperature better. Um, and then one day it was too cold, so I used the um, indoor stove or the electric stove. And because I've got a really good um, uh, pot with a, with a copper bottom, I found that uh, it wasn't too bad that when I turned the heat off, it would keep the heat quite regular, yeah. uh, even temperature. And so ever since, I've made it in the kitchen when the kids are not home because they don't like the smell. The smell of what? Making cheese? 
went, oh, mum, you're making cheese again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, I'll make sure they're not going to be home and then I make it. They love the cheese. They just don't like the smell of the milk. So oh, okay. Yeah. I really no. never noticed the smell of the milk personally. Uh, me neither. No. Oh, well. So uh, <laughs> what are some of your challenges um, when you're making cheese? Challenges. Um, some of my challenges, well, I think feta has been a challenge. I've tried to sort of get the hang of that and that hasn't really worked out. Um, what else? Finding the time, that's that's a bit tricky too because yeah. even though I, I like to leave myself a four-hour sort of window and I know that you can do things in between when you're waiting for you know, the rennet and the culture to do its stuff. But, yeah, finding the time because it takes a bit of room up in your kitchen and you don't want sort of people coming in and, you know, in a nice sterile environment making a mess. So I think that's a bit of a challenge. Um, what else? I did write something down, challenges. Um, I did have a problem with a, an expanded Romano that I – and Romano and a Parmesan that I waxed and oh, about four months down the track it started to grow. Oh, yes. And um, well, I'm going to have to cut it open. So I did, and it was quite holy, uh, but the kids loved it. So mm. they ate. Yeah. yeah, I had a similar experience with uh, one or two of my Parmesans where they swelled up and went, yeah. all, went all bloaty and, and just looked like one big uh, Emmental with one big bubble in the middle. So, yeah, yeah but it, take, look, once you grate it, it was fine. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it was uh, dubious milk quality. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I used... And I don't use it anymore. I use just a bog standard um, home brand milk, okay. uh, full cream, and I, I haven't used it since, and I haven't had that problem since. Yeah, maybe I had a, um, a dodgy batch, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But it's it's funny how it's the same cheese as as it happened to me too. So. Yeah, and it was a bit disappointing because it was sort of a few months in, and you know you have to wait a long time for Parmesan and Romano. So I sort of thought mm, I was a bit reluctant to open it, but. It had to be done, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what are some of your favourite cheeses to make? I really like to make uh, Cotswold because there's no stirring, I don't think. Is there, is there any stirring in Cotswold? Oh, not very much. I don't know oh, not what... Cotswold, sorry, a uh, Blue Stilton. Oh, okay, yeah, because it's yeah. Uh, there's not too much at all. Yeah, and, um, yeah, so I like to make that and I love to make mozzarella uh, because it's quick and we have a wood oven, a uh, pizza oven, and um, so... We've always got, if we're going to have pizzas, we can just um, uh, get a batch together really quickly. And I've had uh, quite, six, oh, it's been successful freezing it too and then yep. putting up pizzas afterwards. So, yeah, that's been good too. Oh, fabulous. So that's the 30-minute variety of um, that's right. mozzarella. Yes, yeah. yeah, good, good. So, yeah, it's a, I got a friend who actually made that without the microwave and uh, it turned out all right. So I have, oh. a, I have a version and I haven't published it. I've got a version where you heat the way up um, further and can go a little bit further with that and uh, don't need to use the microwave. Oh, that would be good to... Yeah, uh, I might post that up. That would be good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so that's the favourite cheeses to make. What about your favourite cheese to eat? And it may not particularly be your cheese, um, but, yeah, do you have any favourites? Yeah, all my favourites are the ones I make. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm biased. I really like the, the Stilton. Oh, I thought that was incredible. And I, I really hadn't had much blue cheese. I can't really remember having blue cheese before. and But just that beautiful creamy taste. And also I like Pyrenees. I've had uh, success with that and I love that flavour. Yeah. So yeah. those two I think would be my favourites as well as mozzarella. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, the blue Stilton, funny shit, I... I bought some imported Stilton from the UK and it didn't taste anything like the blue Stilton that I make. Um, it yeah. didn't It didn't have that creaminess. It was really, really tart. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it was, the, the flavour was not like I was expecting. So I quite prefer my own blue Stilton than, um, than one that I imported. So Yeah. Anyway, so um, what, what goes with cheese for you? Or um, uh, bubbly, or red or white wine. <laughs> any any particular cheese with any particular wine? No. <laughs> Just any any wine you've got on hand. 
Oh, yes, it's nice if it's a Barossa uh, wine or a local wine. Yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, I'm not fussy. So where do you source your milk? Um, I source the milk at Foodland, which is an independent grocer here in South Australia. I'm not sure. I think it might be IGA in other states. But, oh, I, think, um, I think we've got a Foodland, yeah. Oh, okay. And they source a lot of or uh, stock a lot of local produce and local um, companies and growers. And it's a dairy called uh, Jersey Fresh in Greenock. And it's um, uh, when you get, I get the two litre container, it's got the big thick wad of cream on the top. It's absolutely delicious, yeah. Okay. So that, um, but I have a friend who has Jersey cows. He um, produces milk fed pork. And I've just organised with him to get some milk within the next couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that will turn out. Oh, okay. Is that a cow share sort of deal that you're going uh, for there? No, he just he um, produces milk fed pork and um, sells that at different restaurants and Barossa Valley, uh, Barossa Valley Farmers Market. And um, he said I can have some. So I've just got to give him a call and uh, organise it um, and then pick it up. Yeah, yeah great. Yeah, yeah, I uh, that the milk you that uh, the milk that you purchase sounds like it's um, what the Americans call uh, cream line milk or non homogenized milk or un right. yeah, 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 and and I've really done the same thing. I've um, leaned towards that type of milk, and you don't need to add the calcium chloride. Uh, right. Yeah, and the curds form very well. I never have any problem. I since I started using unhomogenized milk, you know, it's pasteurized, of course, but yeah. it um, the curd structure is just amazing. I never yeah. had a problem with any of the cheeses. Yeah, and I find that you know, depending if I've had it in the fridge, um, I'll always have lots of cream on, so I can make a bit of butter on the side. <laughs> skim that off. Yeah, yeah. Don't skim too much off. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, where do you get your um, your ingredients? So the things like the cultures and, and that sorts uh, of things. When I, when I first started, I got it from, I think it's Green Living. Oh, okay, in Queensland, yep. Yeah, that's right. I got all my gear from them. Uh, but I found a place called, now, uh, it's not Bacon Brew. It's Bacon something. Um, down here in South Australia, not far from where I work. Uh, I think they're a franchise and they do um, beer and cheese um starters or that sort of thing oh okay yeah um, yeah so i've been buying my cultures and um bits and pieces from them yeah. oh fantastic so they're um they're obviously affordable and um and quite close yes very close yeah five minutes from work so i only just stumbled across them i didn't realize they were there so that was good yeah it's good to find a local supply because um yeah. Yeah, you know, not that I don't I don't mind using uh, the stuff from Green Living Australia. I've I've also bought stuff from um, Cheese Links here in uh, Victoria as well, um, yeah. and had no trouble with any of them. So uh, it's really good. So um, what uh, what words of encouragement would you give for the beginner cheese maker? The beginner cheese maker, um, just give it a go. I reckon because. Um, just got to have a bit of enthusiasm and I'm sure it'll be edible. If I can make it, anybody can make it. That's what I think. <laughs> you know, a bit slap dash and don't follow instructions to the T. I try to, but, um, and another thing I would say would be because I'm a list person. So I keep a cheese diary and that's been, that's been fantastic because I uh, can look back and see, you know, how that cheese performed or am I put tasting notes on it too? and um, get the family to um, let me know what they thought about it or whoever's over at the time tasting the cheese. And that's been a really good reference. Uh, yeah, so I'd recommend definitely to do, have a cheese diary. Oh, okay. Do you use any specific template or do you just make it up yourself? No, it's just in an old notebook and I just sort of put in, when I, ma when I created it, what number cheese it is, when it's due, uh, what ingredients I used um, and sort of, how things went. I've just made a gruyere. I haven't made that before on the weekend. And the cur there didn't seem as many curves as I thought there should be. So, you know, little notes like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything that happens along the way. Um, and, yeah, I found it really valuable for when you want to go back and check things or, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that sort of thing is valuable. Uh, I use the Little Green Cheese blog to do the same sort of yeah. thing. So, 
So that's that's my cheese diary, and then I can go back and say, oh, when, when's, when's that kafili ready? So just go back that's when right. I did a post about it or something like that. So yeah. so that works fine. Well, and been... the other thing I would say would be to get onto your little green cheese um, site and follow your YouTube tutorials because you just can't really go wrong. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Thanks very much, Sharon. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no problems at all. Well, that, that's, uh, I think, all we've got time for today for the interview. Is there anything else, any parting words? Any parting words? Oh, I love, I love being able to say that I'm a cheesemaker. It's good, isn't it? I know, and blessed are the cheesemakers. <laughs> oh, straight out of the life of Brian. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thanks very much for your time, Sharon. Uh, you're welcome, Gavin. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Right, this episode we're going to skip the news and we're going to go straight to listener emails and voicemails. So the first one is from Gillian. And Gillian writes, Hi Gavin, love your blogs. I just had a question with regard to maturing cheese. I have previously waxed hard cheeses, Parmesan style, with mixed results. My next experiment was with just the cheese sealer, something like PVA glue, and left it like that as I had a little accident with the wax. This still turned out okay. I am loath to use wax again and would like your opinion on vacuum sealing cheeses in plastic. Do you have any tips, fors or against? Thanks. Thanking you in anticipation. Kind regards. Jill. Well, thank you very much for your uh, email, Jill. The answer basically to that is that I think that the PVA uh, glue type wax is just used to seal the cheese. It also has an antibacterial in it, so it will stop uh, moulds, funguses, bacteria from growing. So once you've got a single coat of that on, you you just paint it on with a a pastry brush or, or a natural bristled paintbrush, and then actually use proper cheese wax to fully seal the cheese. Um, I've heard, I actually haven't used this method myself, but my friend David over in Canada uh, mentions that's the way he does it and he doesn't have any problems with um, mould breaking through the, the wax and the PVA coating. Now I've just started using uh, vac packing myself and have found that it's okay. Um, I haven't actually tried any cheese that has been vac packed. I've got a Emmental that's vac packed. I've got a, uh, I've got an Emmental that's vac packed, and I've also got a Cotswold, which uh, is a English style double Gloucester, um, which I've made a, a cheese making video about, but I haven't produced, I haven't published it yet, because I'm waiting to see how the cheese turns out. So uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's what you should do with the PVA glue and uh, and then wax it again. So the next question is from Jerry in uh, Gold Canyon, Arizona, I believe. Uh, Jerry writes, "Hi Gavin, I just finished up with a two-gallon milk recipe, about two pounds of a gouda. Question is, I pressed the whole recipe into one disc, about seven inches." by 1.5 inches thick. I have placed the cheese into the salt brine, dried for a two day drying period. Thinking about this, would it be too late to cut this disc into quarter slices before ripening and waxing for aging? Help, Jerry. Well, thanks for your question, Jerry. Um, My answer would be that you should leave the cheese wheel intact. It actually ages better. The The fats distribute better as you turn the cheese. Uh, It is less prone to drying out because if you put it into quarters, it would probably dry out a little bit quicker, even with uh, with the wax. So mature it fully as the whole wheel itself and then cut it into quarters once it's mature. And if you need to store it further, then, uh, then wax those quarters. And the next uh, is a voicemail, and this one's from Ian. Uh, hello, Gavin. My name's Ian. Um, Gavin, I'm in, in, inquiring as to why, uh, uh, when you're making some of the cheeses, um, you use whole milk, and yet when you made the uh, Colby, you you used 
uh, unhomogenized milk. Um, I, I'm just in, inquiring as to um, what, why you're doing that. Well, thanks, Ian. Thanks for your voicemail. Now, have a reply back to this privately, but I'll give the listeners, listeners the, uh, the same answer, basically. Um, I previously did use uh, whole milk uh, or full cream milk that was just the uh, bog standard supermarket brand stuff. Uh, I found that that, uh, that milk was not good enough quality to make a really good curd and it wouldn't set properly. So I went searching for unhomogenized or non-homogenized milk, which I've been able to find a regular supplier. Uh, and it comes in two litre cartons. It's about $4 for, t for, for two litres, so it's about $2 a litre. And uh, yeah, it, it really does make the best cheese. And I've really stuck to that lately. Essentially, it's the same um, milk, except one's one hasn't been through the homogenization process and the other one has. Uh, and I think they take a bit of the, uh, the cream out of the, out of the home brand version, the supermarket uh, version, and leave all the cream in the non-homogenized version. Like I said, it makes a firmer curd and it is much easier to use and it tastes a lot better too. Anyway, that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for dropping by. If you want to find any of my cheesemaking courses, they're available. Uh, all the dates are there on the littlegreencheese.com. You can also find my book, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, A Beginner's Guide to Cheesemaking at Home. Uh, and there's a link there to that as well. And you can find all of my video tutorials on my YouTube channel. Uh, which is Greening of Gavin. And uh, you can also find all of the recipes for free on littlegreencheese.com. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, News Theme, and Call to the Dairy Cows.